Go Hunt Live show hosted by Todd Nevins. This is Todd Nevins, and I interview people that had seemingly normal lives and careers going, but they pulled the ripcord to epically reinvent themselves in order to pursue a life full of purpose and passion. This episode is sponsored by PrintDirtCheap.com. Jeff Chrisman, the founder of Print Dirt Cheap, and the crew there are rock stars when it comes to delivering top quality printing at a cheap price. If you've met me in the last three years and I handed you a business card, it was printed by Print Dirt Cheap. They're my online digital printing company for everything. They do banners, company letterhead, a ton of direct mail pieces, funky decals, even menus for restaurants, over 30 categories of printing products, and yes, business cards. And they do it fast and they do it cheap. Jeff has streamlined every little aspect of the business to provide the perfect user experience delivering the best product in the industry. I have personally been to the offices and I have seen it firsthand. But see for yourself. Go to printdirtcheap.com and use promo code GOHUNTLIFE and get $10 off of your order. Or if you want to get a sample of their work, click on Sample Pack and they'll mail you one out for free. Go to printdirtcheap.com, use promo code GOHUNTLIFE for $10 off of your next print job. This episode is also sponsored by one of my companies, Click Placement. We are a pay-per-click marketing agency specializing in PPC badassery. We have literally helped hundreds of companies over the last decade drive engagement through paid search advertising using Google AdWords and Bing Ads, LinkedIn, and of course, Facebook. We work with startups, established businesses, and nonprofits to customize campaigns to drive sales or leads, build brand awareness, sell products, or generate mobile app downloads. Hit us up at clickplacement.com or on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn to start a conversation. He said, your problem is you don't have systems in place. You really run the business, you know, uh, like most entrepreneurs, and that's out of your pocket, right? You just day-to-day trying to okay. get through. He said, why don't you build a business that has systems in place that will allow you to do whatever you want to do? You know, he goes, treat your business like an ATM, That is serial entrepreneur Jeff Chrisman. He's the founder of Print Dirt Cheap. Yes, the sponsor of this podcast. And he's got a really interesting story. He's ripcorded and reinvented multiple times, and he's done it by not following the corporate world rulebook. And that reference of building a business so he can do what he wants, that was a few years ago. But he listened to his coach and mentor, and then he implemented what he was being taught. He's designed his business that now enables him to live part of the time in Bakersfield, California, where the company's headquartered, and then part of the time outside of the United States. And his business is thriving along with his unique lifestyle. So if you're a business owner and think that you could never travel extensively because of your business, or you could never live in another part of the world while still running it successfully, this is your episode. My conversation with Jeff Chrisman starts right now. Jeff, thank you for joining me today. Happy to be here, Todd. So you are in, we are together, and uh, this is one of the first interviews that I've ever done face-to-face with a guest. So if we were to walk outside, describe what you would see. You know, this is my first time to Austin, so um, I'm I'm really impressed. Outside, I see high-rise buildings going up. Uh, I see construction galore. I see a a hip, growing active town um you know looking out the window of this room right here i can see and galvanize you know all these people entrepreneurs um busting their butts to uh get something going and and that's my kind of environment you know i'm i'm a i'm a guy that roots for the entrepreneur the underdog and that's kind of what our business is all about too is helping entrepreneurs and startups and small businesses maximize their marketing budget and um you know, be able to do more with less so that they can grow their business. So, okay. How old are you? Are you married? And do you have kids? I will be 45 this year. Um, I am married and I do have three crazy boys. How old? Going to be nine in October, uh, four. And the youngest is three today. All right. Sorry. I missed your, your birthday, Leo. What I'll be home soon. What are your primary ways that you make money? Um, Okay, so 
currently, all my energies are really focused on our company, printdirtcheap.com. Although we do have uh, other interests uh, that my coach, Eric, would call distractions sometimes. Um, okay. But uh, real estate investment is uh, high on the list. Um, and, and I'm really a, a serial entrepreneur, so I'm always coming up with new things. And it is kind of a distraction to try to, to stay uh, honed in on your primary bread and butter business. Okay, so there are a couple of reasons why I wanted to talk to you today. Number one, you and I know each other for many years back in Merida. You're a serial entrepreneur, but you are running your company that is headquartered in Bakersfield, California. Part of the time, you are in Merida, Mexico. Correct. But you've created the systems that allow you, that basically I'm, I'm going after the people that are um, living in the United States. I can't move somewhere or do something crazy because I have a business. You have a business also, and it's not just an online business. It's not something that you can run from anywhere. It's brick and mortar, it's paper, it's printing. <coughs> and I got to first say that uh, you're also the sponsor of the Go Hunt Life podcast. Ah. So thank you very much You're welcome. For that. We're, we're happy to sponsor the podcast. So, you, so you've created the systems that are in place to allow you to live outside of the country to run a business that's headquartered in the United States. But let's first go back to pre-Ripcore. How long ago did you move out of the United States? Okay, so what we'll do is we'll, we'll back up to uh, before Print Dirt Cheap. Our company has always been known as Icon Printing Solutions. Um, it really started as Icon Publishing. Originally, we were doing high school yearbooks or annuals, as they're called in some places. And that was a, a corporate America job. You know, I worked for a $300 million company and had to follow a lot of rules. I did that for three years. What year was that? Uh, this was 98 through 2001. Okay. And that was kind of recovering from a failed um, entrepreneurial endeavor. You know, I took this corporate job to get back on my feet and realized I did not like working for a company. You know, I, I have to be my own boss because I just see things differently. And one of the things that, that was an argument was I met someone on a plane that wanted um, really high-end custom printing done, and it had to do with Looney Tunes and NFL uh, licensing. Okay. And the company had the ability to do it in the off-season, but because I was new, they didn't want me to get involved in that. And I was like, hey, this could be a huge account. Let's bid it and let's work it out. And they're like, no, 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 just focus on on yearbooks and I'm like but it's summer I don't need to let me do something you know I have to constantly be doing something right so anyway I left that business and started commercial printing for all my entrepreneur friends I was just brokering you know I would do some design and broker the print job to a different printer or What's something broker me uh, brokering just means that you work with a trade printer that only prints for licensed graphic designers and uh, businesses that are in the design trade. So like uh, photographers, sign shops, um, graphic designers, marketing agencies. Anyway, so that's how I started and basically didn't own any equipment. This was back in 2001. Didn't own any equipment, strictly brokered. And Icon Printing Solutions was born uh, because we, we would find solutions to your print needs. You know, a, a lot of times when you go to a commercial printer and you ask them for something, they tell you, well, this is what our equipment does, so this is the best solution for your problem. Okay. And just because that's the only equipment they have, they try to sell you that product or service. Okay. Yeah. And we looked at it from, well, what, what's actually best for, for your needs? We'll find a source to, to get that done. So... Um, after a few years, we got some of our own equipment and we were still brokering, but uh, started adding equipment and, and it was growing and, and we decided to go online. There were only a few online printers at the time. Um, Vistaprint had just barely started and they, it was pretty much just the business cards that you saw around that said business cards are free at vistaprint.com on the back. Okay. Um, and there were maybe a, a half a dozen online printers. So we went online and 
had uh, instant success of wholesaling business cards and postcards uh, under the name Acme Color Printing Inc. And Acme. I, yeah, okay. and I formed that company with Dave. That, okay. That you know. Okay. And that worked pretty well for a couple of years, and um, then we had different uh, domain names that we sold under Colorama Printing. Dot com was one and what happened was is around 2005 2006 everybody realized they should be selling printing online and all the printers went online and margins just got cut in half um, prices dropped drastically and I became really disenchanted with the online uh, part because I didn't have the the tech savvy to be able to compete with some of the technology. For example, Vistaprint doesn't make any money on the business cards, but they shove a whole bunch of other products down your throat. You know, okay. they charge you for a graphic or a font change or a whatever. And then they add on a case and a magnet. And I didn't really have the, the technical savvy to be able to okay. create a site that could do that. So I became a little disenchanted and um, I wanted to get out of the business. So I actually sold uh, the business, you know, I was like, what's the best thing I could do? Sell the business and go do something else. So I sold the business. I, I had gone to Belize on vacation. This is coming up on ripcord number one. Yeah. Ripcord number one. Okay. <laughs> I had, I had gone to Belize on vacation <laughs> and, uh, my wife and I, and, uh, we said, Hey, wouldn't it be great to, to just live in the Caribbean? You know, it, it's, it's, it's a dream for a lot of people, but I think as a, as a young person, my family moved a lot. And so I never really got this sense of I have to stay in one place my whole life. Hmm. Okay. We, we moved all over the place. So um, for me, it was just like going on a permanent vacation. So I sold the business. We moved down there. I went ahead and she was in new home sales and new homes were booming in the 2000s. So the plan was... Once she sold out her um, her track that she was working, we would just go there permanently. And I opened an internet cafe <clears throat> on the on the beach. In, that was how you were going to pay for it. Did you have? Yeah. Did you? Could you work off of savings, or you had to well, make had something this, down I had there? Money from the uh, from the sale of the business, and we would have the money from. Uh, her okay. closings. Yep. And we were like, you know, we can live cheap. The internet cafe, some days we'd make 30 bucks, some days we'd make 100 bucks. All right. It was amazing. We, we would actually make more money in the off season from locals renting movies than. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. People using the, the internet cafe. Okay. Because we right. had computers. You were renting movies. Rented. Mo I had the largest actual DVD collection in Belize because. Everyone in Central America has uh, bootlegs, right? They're, yeah. they're the shaky camera yeah. videos. I had authentic. I had 1,200 authentic uh, DVDs that I brought down with me and rented those. And then we had two PlayStations with hammocks. So you could hang in the hammocks and play PlayStation. So the kids were in there all the time. Okay. And uh, a few computers for uh, tourists to surf the net. And I was like, hey, this is great. I'll raise my kids here on the beach. You were going to be done. That was it. Done. And... <clears throat> Excuse me. Some some things happened with my wife's business. She she was like the number one salesperson, right? And they were paying a very low commission. And she went to her boss one time and asked for a raise. And I think um, the the company wanted to maximize their profits, so they basically told her, "We can't give you the raise, so we're going to let you go." Okay. And she didn't get any of those closings, even though she had contracts on dozens of homes. Okay. Because the, her employment contract said if you leave the company before they close, you don't get Okay. So she went to another company. <clears throat> we kept the same plan, went to a new company. She received uh, a sales award for the highest sales volume in Southern California for this company. Okay. And it was the same situation. All the contracts were open and they were doing closings. And the builder hired a very inexperienced project manager that did not connect sewer and electricity for the development. They did That's not, a problem. They did not apply for it when they started construction. So homes were being finished. They were ready to close. And there was no electricity or sewer, so people couldn't take their homes. Now, now um, I had, uh, during the first stint of her switch, I had said, hey, let me come back 
to California. I had come back and decided uh, mutually with the person that bought my business to take it back over and run that while we tried to figure this whole thing out. And what happened was is because the homes could not close, then the market turned and people stopped being able to qualify. So this is 08, 09. Uh, yeah, this is like, uh, this is early 08. Okay. Things started to tighten up. To turn. Up. Um, the, the half of her people lost their homes that they had already done contract on. Yep. And um, it ended up getting really bad. And we just realized she, she needed to get out of that business. It was just brutal. So um, I <clears throat> had not wanted to be in print because of the competition online. And I thought that building a business and then selling it was like the, the best plan you could do as an entrepreneur, you know, right. build a business, sell it, build right. a business, sell it. Well, when I moved back, I ended up meeting a coach through a networking group and I hired this coach cause I was like, you know, I, I really need some help finding my, finding a way to deal with all this. And I hired this business coach and I, I worked with them from, uh, oh, mid 2000s um, all the way up till now we'll get to 2010 when we decided to launch Print Dirt Cheap. That, that was 2010 because he told me one time, he said, why do you want to sell your business? He said, your problem is you don't have systems in place. You really run the business, you know, uh, like most entrepreneurs and that's out of your pocket, right? You just day to day trying to okay. get through. He said, why don't you build a business that has systems in place that will allow you to do whatever you want to do. You know, he goes, treat your business like an ATM. Don't, don't treat it like a piece of property that you sell and you get the money, build a business that's an ATM so you can get money anywhere you go. What, what did print dirt cheap look like when he told that to you? Okay. And he we, said that to you, we, we had, when I took the business back over, sales had dropped a lot and by that time, we had just about recovered to where we were before. And we're, we're still, you know, really small business. We were, okay. we were doing, um, you know, I think less than half a million a year in sales. And okay. uh, we decided that in order to compete with these other companies and not having the best technology, first we had to look for new technology. Um, we had to find ways to... to what it, what's new tech? Like new printers, new no, website? Well, not new just printers, but online technology for making the uh making the online purchase smooth okay and uploading yeah being able to 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 look more like the big billion dollar companies all you right know what i mean so we went with big commerce at the time which is a, a company local based, company yeah, based out of austin here and uh it was the best solution at the time <clears throat> although there were a lot of limitations and um, we did that. And then we also said, well, how can we cut our overhead so that we can cut our prices? Because we had to lower prices uh, to compete with these online giants, right? Okay. So the idea came around that um, if, if these guys can outsource, maybe we can outsource. Right? Because that's how a lot of people were cutting their overhead. They're so outsourcing. To where? To India? Overseas? Anywhere. or Where it's cheaper to do business. So what were they outsourcing, though? The actual printing? No. Or, or the customer service? Outsourcing their tech. You know, a lot of these guys have whole technology departments in the Philippines. All right. And so all um, the web design was going to be... A Offshore all that for them. would be offshored. Customer services offshored. Um, even Vistaprint. And, and I don't want to... I don't want to... Do your own research so that uh, I'm not responsible for for saying something that's inappropriate. But I believe Vistaprint is based in the Bahamas for their U.S. operations. Okay. And the corporation is based out of Belgium or someplace. Okay. And because they're in the Bahamas, they take advantage of all kinds of loopholes. Sure. Right? So uh, it's kind of if you can't beat them, join them okay. mentality. And working with my coach to develop systems that could be put in place so that we could be profitable, even lowering prices and streamlining the operation so that we could, you know, raise our volume. And hopefully I, I think that they call it, if you're going to do high volume, you can lower profits, but, okay. um, so <clears throat> an interesting situation came around with a family member where we, 
I, I wanted to give a family member a job that was living in Mexico due to circumstances. And I said, well, um, there's technology that will allow this to happen. So in my networking group, uh, we had a, a guy that we call the phone guy. That's his business, the phone guy. Okay. And he does traditional phone systems. And he was always talking about VOIP. Uh -huh. We've all heard about VOIP. I had... Um, I had, uh, what's the one with Vonage? Orange? I had Vonage at home for at some point, and so I, I thought we could make this work somehow. That right? was the first system that could work internationally for you was Vonage. That was a system that I had, but that's not what we used. I had had Vonage at home, so I knew that we could do something yeah, with the internet technology was there. or whatever. And the phone guy was like, hey, I can, I can get you a system like that. In Mexico. Yeah. He, he, so we switched the phone system in our office to a Samsung VOIP based phone system. And okay. we, we sent a uh, Ethernet phone down to Mexico that was tied in with our office phone. And that was the first experiment of having somebody work remotely uh, in Mexico for the company. What and year was that? This was, I think this was 2010. 2010s to seven years ago. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. I think it was right when we launched uh, Print Dirt Cheap. All right. It may have been a little before, a little after. I, I don't remember exactly. Okay. But so <clears throat> that worked um, very well. It really helped that uh, family member uh, have gainful employment. And uh, was she tied in to the computer system as well, to the ordering system, all of that stuff? Right. So, uh, she was tied into everything just as if she was in the office. She just was in a different office. Okay. So it, it, what's interesting is if you have a, a customer service heavy business where you talk to people on the phones and you do everything over the internet, if you think about it, you don't, you could be anywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the listeners and a lot of your, your guests, obviously they're everywhere. But it's one thing to have one customer service person work remotely over in Mexico you, the president, CEO of the company, then made the decision to work part of the time remotely in Merida, Mexico, is the remotely city yeah. that we're talking about. That's a whole different ball game when the boss is overseas. Right. So let's we'll fast forward a little bit. We started with the one employee. Then we added a, a second employee. Then we added a third employee and all out of Mexico, all out of Mexico. OK. And uh in the same region, but all working from home. So it wasn't hmm. an office, all right. a physical office. And the, the beauty is, is it did save us a little bit um, as opposed to like American wages because we're paying Mexican wages. But um, the beauty is it, it allowed our company to grow to where we were able to add more equipment. We were able to hire more people. I think, um, the the flexibility there helped us through a, a really tough time when we were growing because you know we're we're self financed you know no debt no funding and no outside no funding. funding so everything is really tight in in the beginning because I kind of look at the beginning of that business as like the starting over again so what happened was is I had a friend in Belize that had told me a while back hey if uh, oh. Let me, let me back up. So in uh, 2010, I think it was, I went back to Belize and found out that the fellow that bought my business from me when I left was killed in a robbery. So he was robbed outside of the business and killed. Hmm. And I was talking to another friend that said, hey, you know, if you really like the Caribbean and we understand that Belize has uh, some economic issues because it's very seasonal. Tourism is when you know the economy is is up, and then mm -hmm. when it's not, it's down. There's not access to a lot of things. There's high tariffs on a lot of things. Um, you don't run down to a Walmart to pick something up, or a, or a Whole Foods, or or anything like that in, in Belize. They said you should check out Merida. It's about eight hours away. It, it's a beautiful colonial town. It's very near the Caribbean. Uh, a couple hours from Riviera Maya and only 30 minutes from the the north coast which is uh is kind of like I guess a Texas Galveston uh, yeah like a Galveston mm -hmm. or, or uh West Florida and um we said hey this would be a nice place to you know raise kids that whole thing about raising our kids someplace 
near the Caribbean. I don't, I don't really know why I see my kids running around on a sandy beach, but that's just where they belong in my head. But that idea is awesome, but you need the infrastructure to run your business. Okay. So how does that fit into not... Back not, to my business coach. Yeah. Oh, Back oh to my okay. Business okay. Coach. So, Got it. Uh, Guy's been an important uh, asset yeah, to you. Yeah, very, very, very important part of my life. Um, and and uh, what happened was is I went through a coaching program with him what was that? What do you mean? Um, he, 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 we did a leadership program okay. basically to give me the tools to be a better leader uh, in the company. Um, you know, as an entrepreneur, I'm, I'm very uh, ADHD, okay. you know, and uh, being that, able to focus. That's not a systems guy. No, I'm not the systems guy. So if, if you look at the E-Myth, the E-Myth says any successful business has an entrepreneur, a manager, and a technician. Okay, uh, I'm the entrepreneur and I'm a technician and I have a very tiny bit of management. So companies like uh, Microsoft where you have a Bill Gates that's a, a entrepreneur and a technician and a manager and he's like a monster in all three. Or right. you look at like, uh, you know, an Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or whatever. Mm -hmm. These guys have all three of those things. That's why they're sole captains of their, of their ships. Mm -hmm. And a lot of businesses that flounder may have a technician that's fantastic. Uh, maybe it's a, a paint, a auto body paint place. The, the guy's fantastic at painting cars, but he can't manage his business. Mm -hmm. So it never grows into something substantial. Mm -hmm. um, so I realized that I needed to hone that skill and I started working with him and it really took about three years to kick in. When it finally you stuck in, with it for three years, though, yeah, that, that's a that's a long time to stick with. Well, that. it was a year long program, but we've been friends ever since, and we often consult with each other and and work with each other on things. The lessons that he taught me about creating systems and uh, working with people to get the results that you need they took a while to kick in, and I I can really see the business accelerating as those things were kicking in. The the the. One of the things that I think is the most important, and, and I would say this to any entrepreneur out there that has issues with personnel, a lot of entrepreneurs want things to be the way they want them to be because you know they came up with the idea, they worked for the idea, and it's, it's their way. I always had a problem with getting the results out of people that I needed because I, it, it's my way, right? Like I'm the boss. Mm -hmm. And... A big one that he helped me with was realizing that sometimes you have to change the way you interact with people to get the results that you need. That's a hard thing to change. It's That's a personality very, change. Yeah, it's very hard. I used to be a, a yeller, you know, like, <laughs> what's wrong with you guys? This is ridiculous. You know, one of those kind of guys. And I realized that that doesn't get you the results that you need. You cannot build a company that can run itself if you're going to be that hot-headed manager guy, right? Right. So anyway... We put some systems in place, uh, made sure that everything is documented. That's really important when you have a business. You know, you don't realize uh, in a small business, even something as simple as an employee handbook, so helpful for employees, right? Um, and we ultimately then, let's get to the ripcord part. We ultimately went back to Merida. We found a piece of property. We started to rehab that property and we said at some point we'd like to be there, you know, raising our kids. Um, and I would go back and forth a lot. And then a few years, three years ago, uh, decided to try to do like a month there and then a couple weeks back in California. And I think the most important part about that in running a company remotely like that is you have to have people you can trust and on both sides on both sides and you have to have people that understand uh the systems and understand their job and it's and once once you outline all that it really isn't rocket science you know if, if there's if there's a response for anything that could happen then and people know what it is things should run smoothly and, and there's still the human element and i think the biggest problem in any system is the human element because that's what fails, right? That's the number one thing that fails. So, okay, so what's the business look like now? It's still in Bakersfield. You've got a physical facility there. How big is it and how many people are sitting in it right now because it's still office hours in California? Okay, so I believe um, 
today we will probably have uh, eight or nine people. Um, we also have a sister company that has uh, five people. And what's that? What do they do? Um, what we what we did was uh, invest in other locations for uh, having a broader reach. Okay. But some of those are co-branded, so I won't really go into those in okay. detail. Just for for sake of everybody's business uh, not being affected. Okay. But, okay. Um, <laughs> It, it helped us expand our, our reach physically so that we could do different things in different locations. Okay. And uh, ra- the, the idea was is rather than put all your eggs in one basket and do everything in one location, if you're going to add a new technology, like a different type of printing, why not, why not put it in another location so that you can expand your physical presence? And that's, uh, that gets back to why I'm here in Austin. You know, I, I think that Austin has uh, been on everybody's radar for quite a few years, and I'm probably behind the, the eight ball on this one. But if you're going to grow your company and you're going to have more production capability, a lot of companies do it in the same location. But I have a hallucination that what the market wants is a more localized printing. So we're looking at possibly opening a manufacturing facility here so that we could serve this market rather than ship from from California. And there okay. are other printers that are that are following this this model that that uh, realize that the best way to service a customer is to be closer so that you don't have the shipping delay. Is it shipping delay? Is it comfort level with the customer? Like, is it face-to-face meeting with the customer or is it just... Well, there's a lot of people, I think, that like the idea of doing business locally, even when they don't see the people they're doing That's business That's Austin. With. There's no doubt. Yeah. Local means money. If right. you're, I mean, that means a ton. In and they may city. never come see you here at the office but when you tell them hey i'm here they have a, a austin a based austin level. based so, okay so that's something we're looking at there okay but, so um, then you may have a third location yeah add to it okay so you need more systems more systems all right so let's go to the systems of your family you're an american your wife is mexican your kids so what is the what's the how are, did your, were your kids born in California or in Mexico? Okay. So I met my wife in California and she is a immigrant. Her father was a, a migrant worker. He would go back and forth, back and forth. Was she born in California? She was born in uh, Mexico, but when her mother passed away, her father brought all the younger kids okay. to California. All right. So her and her uh, younger brother and sister grew up in California. California from teenage years. Okay. So she's from uh, north central Mexico, not from Merida. And um, when uh, I think when I said that I, I would move to Mexico, she was a little surprised. Uh, you know where I'm going. The Delvin. dynamic of growing up, uh, kids growing up in the United States versus growing up in Mexico from a schooling perspective, from a from a freedom perspective, safety, pers- like all of those things. Yeah. I think... Uh, one of the things that I like about the kids growing up in Mexico, well, first of all, they go back and forth a lot, so they get to experience both. But I feel like the school they go to is more like the school I went to as a kid. Okay. Um, things are a little bit more old fashioned. The children being able to read and write and do math is very important to the school. And it's the type of school I think that would not just pass a kid to pass them, you know, they're going to. Right. In the U.S., we have a lot of issues with, with issues like that. My parents both being educated. We've talked about it a lot. Um, education is not the same now as it was when I was a kid. So I think education is, is fine. Um, is it in Spanish or English? Spanish. They go to a Spanish school with one hour English a day. Okay. And, but to give you an idea, uh, my oldest could read and write in English and Spanish in first grade. So even though he only had an hour of English, you know, we worked with him flashcards and, and not and, okay and he he does fantastic so we'll see how the other two do the littlest one starts this fall that'll be interesting um what's their go-to if they like if they are talking at home in the kitchen uh, english if they're spanish. talking to my wife it's spanish if they're talking to me it's english they switch just yeah. like that yeah and the four-year-old started school this last year and his spanish just 
came like that. It was amazing. He, he would never speak Spanish at home. And after going to school, boom, he speaks Spanish. You know, he talks to the, the nanny in Spanish. And, and I just sit there and, and listen to him. And I'm so amazed because my Spanish is so, is so horrible and broken. But um, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And about the safety issue, you know, th there, is, there is no safety issue. Uh, I, I don't want to get into conspiracy theories, but I can tell you that what's <laughs> happening at the border is isolated and it's being allowed to happen for reasons that are more complex than we have time in this sure. to talk about. Sure. But down there, uh, it's as safe as could be. I mean, when I'm back in the States, uh, Maria used to walk to, to Dairy Queen with Ana Lucia. She'd go to Dairy Queen at 10 o'clock at night, yeah. not worry about anything with the kids, you know? So, I mean, you know, I'm yeah. preaching to the choir. Yep. Here. All right. So looking forward today into the future, next six months with your business, what is what are the big things to expect out of Print Dirt Cheap in the next six months? Okay. So we have this uh, new website that is in development. It's in beta testing right now that has online design tools. This goes back to having the technology that we need to compete so you can design online. Uh, in two weeks, we'll be launching the HTML5 version of that designer because Flash is going away. You know, sure. nobody's supporting Flash anymore. And uh, that'll be a better uh, user experience for our, our customers. Um, this site has a lot of features that we could not get from Big Commerce. Um, Big Commerce did not have custom statuses until last year, meaning that if you're a manufacturer, you could not change the status of an order to meet your manufacturing needs, like uh, in the design department, in the press department, in the post press department, all you could put is awaiting fulfillment. And so customers are, are totally disserviced when you use a software like that and all, all they, the only update they can get is that their order is awaiting fulfillment. And so this switch uh, allows us to get information to our customers uh, that is more precise. We have SMS notifications. Oh, uh, we have push notifications that can go, you know, to your yep. to your uh, desktop. Okay. Um, we're going to be working on an app um, that will tie in some some new features, but uh, that that technology part is uh, also paired with new equipment that allows us to print better, faster, and cheaper for our customers. Okay. Um, and hopefully soon uh, more locations so we can expand our to okay. serve local. all right so last one of the last questions is that there's a guy that's listening or girl that owns name it let's say it's a chain of like five auto repair places or five tire places and it's like man that sounds great but sounds like jeff's business is is more adaptable to allow me to move somewhere cool than what mine is. Like, what would you say to someone that's using the, I own a business, like you haven't used the, I have other people say, well, I've got a family, kids are in school, I can't up and go to Mexico or <coughs> Costa Rica or wherever. You had a family, you crossed that one off the list. You focused in on your designing systems for your business. Like, what do you tell that guy? Like, no man, you can do this because I'm living proof. What's his first step? Well, the first step is um, you have to get past the mindset that you can't trust other people. I deal with so many entrepreneurs mm. that do not want to delegate or do not want to give up control. And I kind of looked at it from this standpoint. We would not have a McDonald's on every street corner if Ray Kroc couldn't give up control of something, right? I'm not saying that McDonald's is the best or worst or whatever. I'm just saying... You can grow a business with systems if you have the right system and you have to have the right people. So if, if you think, um, I can never trust anybody to do this the way I would do it, you're probably right. They're not gonna do it 100% the way you could do it. But if they do it 99% or 98% the way that you would do it, and if you have something in place as a backup, so if it's not done the way that you, you wanna do it, checks and balances, um, Let's look at it. Let's look at a tire shop. So, a tire shop uh, is a very labor-intensive business. There's an inventory, but it's mainly a lot of labor to get mm -hmm. that inventory on the vehicle, right? Um, it's not rocket science. 
there's a list. You do this first, then you do this. When you get to this stage, then you put it on this machine and you balance it and you do that. And if people will follow the system, um, it, it should be able to work itself. And if you get a good manager and you put that manager in place, I think the other problem is a lot of people say, I can't, nobody will do it the way I would do it. Well, you got the wrong people. And okay. it's, it's so easy as an entrepreneur to get emotionally attached to people and hire people because of the way you feel about them, not because of the way they do their job. That's another thing. I, I used to hire people based on my feelings and I would never really give people tests to see if they were the right person, if they could perform what it was that I wanted them to do. And I think if you're going to uh, develop a, a, a company that, that can run uh, autonomously, you, you have to be able to, uh, if you have a person that's not the right person, you know, find the right person. Because mm -hmm. um, in, in the end, you have to look at it like this. It's not necessarily like you wanting to live the life that you want to live. But if you build a company that can grow, many people benefit from that. All your employees benefit from it. Yeah, sure. I benefit being that I get to go back and forth. You know what? If I didn't have my Miles credit card, I wouldn't be going back and forth all the time. You know, it's not, I'm, I'm not some uh, millionaire uh, globetrotter, but uh, I figured out a way to do it. Mm -hmm. And if you settle for mediocre, you're going to have a mediocre business. You know, if, if, if you, a good example is like if, if we, we have problems in print, somebody has a problem with their print order, it's, it's, a, it's still a manual process. It's still an analog process. Sure, we have digital presses and we have offset presses, but it's still an analog process. There's a lot of hands involved in it. And what happens is mistakes may come up. It's how you deal with mm -hmm. that mistake. Do you take care of that customer or do you argue with the customer and say, you know what, we balanced that tire on the car when it came in here. Empower your employees to resolve customers' problems on their own and you will see your business change just in that itself. If your employees are empowered to help customers, you will see a change in your business. We're going to end at that. I've got one more question though, and I know you listen to the podcast, mm -hmm. and if you don't know the answer to this question, I'm oh, going Lord. to be shocked. All right, <laughs> on Put July on July 22nd, 2010, at 6.54 p.m., oh, no. Oh, no. you sent out your first tweet. Do you remember what it was? Um, I don't because it probably was not me. I had a guy that was helping me with social media because I was one of those, and, and I know you got a time limit on this podcast, but I was one of those guys that was uh, resistant to social media because I'm like, I don't, I don't have time for that. I'm, I don't want to fart around on the internet and get yeah. pictures. So I, I actually brought a guy in to do it. I have no idea what the tweet was. He had a pretty good social media game. I got to give him, see, you hired the right person. Yeah. There you go. All right. Did you know that printing is the second largest manufacturing industry in the United States with regard to the number of establishments? Hmm. Did you know that? Uh, well, I probably gave him that content. <laughs> but you know what's interesting is since that was so long ago, uh, we lose something like 3,000 printers a year or something like that. It's a ridiculous number. Why? Because paper's the, going away? Because the, the small mom and pop shop just can't compete with online. And that's exactly where we were going back to 2010. How do we compete? Okay. How do we stay relevant? And All so, right. Anyway. You can find Jeff at printdirtcheap.com and also on Facebook and Twitter, Twitter at Print Dirt Cheap. Jeff, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Don't forget to hit up the rock stars at printdirtcheap.com. Use promo code GOHUNTLIFE for $10 off of your next print job. For fast, cheap, and high-quality online printing, it's printdirtcheap.com. Hey, Life Hunters, thank you for listening to this episode of Go Hunt Life. If you like the show and would like to support it, go to iTunes and do this. Subscribe to the show, leave a rating, and review it. It helps, and thank you. If you or someone that you know has quit their normal life to follow their dreams, I would love an introduction and maybe interview them on the show. You can find me at GoHuntLife.com and also on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest at GoHuntLife. Until next time, stay weird, dare greatly, and ripcord out.